Hi. Uh, yes, so today's talk, uh, at least this last topic, to sort of catch people up, is on rational exponents. I'm not at all sure if uh, my intention is to finish the whole chapter by Friday. I doubt if I will. Because, um, let's see. Some of this might be new to you. So, well, really the concepts of of uh, functions should be, you know, of rational, uh, no, sorry, exponential functions as functions should be new to you, I would expect. Um, um, exponent, uh, ex laws of exponents? Well, uh, you might have covered some of them in grade 10. Um, I'm going to treat these uh, two as new. So, um, you know, uh, I did cover laws of exponents in my video from last week. It's still up on the timeline. And um, if uh, we look ahead, uh, there's properties of exponential functions. So in other words, you know, I've already explained some of the properties of exponential functions in the last video uh, when I showed you uh, through exponential modeling the features of a, of a graph in that uh, the x-axis was a horizontal asymptote. Um, but then uh, you'll find that that law can be broken. You can actually, through uh, graphical transformations, you can break those rules. But it, the fact always remains that there will always be a horizontal asymptote somewhere for an exponential function. Always. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, and that's covered in 3.5 when we cover uh, transformations of exponential functions. And we'll do everything we did when we were doing um, when we were doing transformations for polynomials, so but we won't spend as much time on it. But we will go through all four transformations. Um, there are some rather peculiar things about transforming exponential functions, and um, you might find that they will remain peculiar when you learn about. Um, its partner in crime, which is logarithms. One of the reasons uh, we teach exponents, of course, in grade 11 is because you actually need to know the laws of exponents very well, because if you don't, and if you don't understand the algebra behind working with exponential functions and exponential expressions, uh, you're going to have trouble with logarithms because it's it uses those things in a whole different way, and you have to sort of change your thinking a bit. Um, but unless you don't have, a, if you don't have a grasp of the laws of exponents, you're going to get totally lost on on uh, logarithms. However, if you do have a grasp of exponents, you'll actually find logarithms quite a lot of fun, and I hope that that's true. So let's just get rid of this gallery thing. Okay, um, three point six tools and strategies for applying exponential models. These are actually just, uh, once again, we're just dealing with, uh, you know, models, I guess. Um, my, my feeling is by about early next week. So this week we will try and cover probably up to 3.4, 3.5. I might give you a couple of days to do 3.4 for transformations. It takes a bit of getting used to. The exponents work expectedly for some transformations and could su could surprise you for other kinds of transformations. Um, but that last part uh, probably is most tied to simulations. And uh, what I'm sort of leaning towards, rather than giving you a conventional test, we're going to make Chapter 3 project-based and give you guys an assignment to do. Well, we last last time we had what was construed to be an assignment, but this will be more of a project, okay? And um, right now, the only place that project is located is up here in my brain. Um, I haven't completely thought about what to do yet. However, uh, I am going to uh, discuss with you 3.3. 3.3 has to do with um, fractional or rational exponents. Now, what we mean by rational, as you know, rational means a fraction. 
right? Now, what's a fraction? A fraction is a whole number divided by another whole number. Well, okay. Uh, no, not necessarily. I guess I, I'm very, being very imprecise here. A, a, a rational number is a whole number divided by a whole number. That's what we understand to be a rational number. An irrational number is when you're unable to do that. You're unable to express a number by dividing a whole number to, by a whole number. Now, there's some obvious numbers that are rational, like 3. 3 is 3 divided by 1. Well, 3 and 1 are both whole numbers. And when you divide them, when you divide the 3 by the 1, you get 3. So 3 is a rational number, but it's also a whole number. What about 1 third? Well, that's 1 divided by 3, a whole number divided by a whole number. What about, you know, 5 over 7? It's not a nice fraction, but it's a fraction. It's rational. 5 over 7, 1 half. So these are all rational numbers. The square root of 2 is not rational because it's impossible to express the square root of 2 in a manner where you would have a whole number divided by a whole number. So that's, that's what makes a, a number you know, irrational. Well, we're going to talk about rational exponents. So what happens when, for example, you have uh, a fraction? So in, in the exponential position, I'm going to bring up an equation. How about if we have, you know, um, 125 to the power of 2 thirds? Oh, that's not very nice. Let's try that again. Um, OK, I guess. It's either all or none with this equation editor. So 125 to the power of, let's put this in brackets, 2 thirds. And, oh, that's ugly. Ah, OK, we got rid of the bracket. So here we have the 2 thirds as a power. So what's happening here? Um, this is equal to, uh, hold on. Let's put this inside the editor. This is equal to, um, something like this uh 125 uh i'll put this in brackets again 125 squared uh to the power of one third oh that's not nice let's try that again to the power of one over three there we go so you can actually and then you know, using this law of exponent, what you're doing is because the one-third is outside the bracket, you multiply it by the exponent inside the bracket. So that becomes two times one-third, which is two-thirds. So that's really equivalent, 125 squared to the one-third. So, but what does one-third mean? What is, that, that still doesn't answer the question. We're still left with a fraction to have to figure out, like, what do you do with that fraction? Well, here's what you do. Here's the other equivalency that we have. Um, now this time I need to go into the math editor to figure out, oh, ah, here we go. I need to go to the math editor to figure out, um, here, this is what we want. Um, one third is the cube root, okay? So one third is the cube root of a number. Well, what is it the cube root of? It's 125 squared, right? So it's the cube root of 125 squared. Now, if we work that out, I mean, yeah, I got a computer here. So if I got Google Sheets, let's get rid of that. Let's call up another Google Sheet. So, um, okay, we could do this. Uh, I don't know if we can magnify or 150. Okay, so equals, equals, um, well, what did we say 125 squared was? Well, we didn't say anything. One, 125 squared is expressed this way in a spreadsheet, and we got 15,625. So then, then we're really saying this the cube root of 15,625 so we're gonna do this Oop. cube root of 15625 and what's that cube root well okay let's let's solve the mystery so 
let's actually let's see I think we can do just this equal sign one five six two five to the power of one third so to the power of and I'll put this in brackets one over three just to make things as accurate as possible you know I know some people would put 0.333 and uh, but you'll lose accuracy when you do that so what happens when you have a rational number instead you get 25 which is the correct answer so um, this is just this whole thing this whole business is just equal to 25 so that's actually you know that's actually what you do with rational exponents you can actually work them out on your calculator uh, on your calculator, you, you probably have, well, let's see. I don't know if I have a... The first time a teacher ever left the... I have a, I have a calculator here that if you kind of look, there's a couple of keys that well, it doesn't, it, it's actually unfortunate that this calculator gives you more graphic icons than symbols in, in terms of what it wants. But some of your calculators would have something like, uh, uh, something like this, y to the power x, for example. Or you might have a, a key like, you know, x to the power y. Or you might have a key like a to the power of uh, b over c, right? Something like that. Um, some of you may have those on your calculator. Um, and they're, they're all useful. In fact, uh, in my opinion, every one of these keys are interchangeable. You don't, you could do anything on any one of those keys. You can actually do this whole section using only one of those keys. You don't have to use you don't have to use each one judiciously. It's, uh, and that's uh, thanks to the laws of exponents that that is true. So most calculators, in fact, most good scientific calculators uh, have a bit of redundancy programmed into them in that there's like, for especially for laws of exponents where they have multiple keys that do the same thing, but you have to key things in differently. So like for y to the x, you'd have, a hun well, 125, and you'd put your two-thirds in the exponent, right? And you'd do the same thing for this key. And here, well, it's already done for you. You key in your 125, and in each of the blanks, you put your two and your three. Okay. So that's uh, that. That's that. That's, um, but then, okay. What about, what about algebra for this? Now, um, This would be good for like what what I have here on the on the screen that you see in front of you would be good for questions one, two, three. There's a whole bunch of them um, up to question four. Basically, using the scheme that I showed you here, you can you're you're good up to question four. Some of them can be done mentally. Some of them, yeah, you might need a calculator. Okay, um, if if this were in class, um, you would be doing them mentally. Uh, obviously, I have no control over this because you're at home and I'm here. I would recommend that you do, looks like you can do all of them mentally, but um, looking at the exercises, but, you know, maybe maybe some of you might get lost on 10,000 to the power of negative three quarters or something. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. Take the root first, right? So, like, for example, like, you would... As, by the way, if I, if, if you look at this last bit here, 125 squared to the one third, I could have done this, which is probably making the thing a little easier for you. 125 to the one third squared. Okay, now. This last one is a little better because a lot of you probably know that 5 cubed is 125, so that it's cube root 
you know, the, the cube root of 125 has to be 5. And then what do you do when you have 5? Well, that's like, then all you have left to do here is 5 squared. Right? All you have left to do is that. And so, and of course, you know the answer there. 5 squared is 120, uh, 5 squared is 25. Okay. So that takes you to there. You know, there's also other things too. Um, for example, um, algebra. Oh, God. Cancel. It's not what I wanted. I wanted this. Um, simplify. Express your answers using only positive exponents. Now, let's say that I have x to the power of one one fourth times x to the power of and I'm I'm looking at 5a here on page 175 x to the power of 1 over 4 well what is that you're you x to the power of 1 over 4 it basically just think about this for a minute if i have two numbers with the same base both of them are x and i and they have different exponents well in this case they have the same exponents let's say i have x squared times x cubed well you'd know right away that you'd add, you'd you'd add the 2 and the 3 wouldn't you well here you're just adding the four the the quarter and the quarter you're adding a quarter to a quarter so this is really just x to the power of the sum of the two exponents. So 1 fourth plus 1 fourth. Okay, and then, well, what's a quarter plus a quarter? Well, it's a half. Okay, so then you have x to the power of 1 over 2. Well, that's just the square root of x, right? We know that to be the square root of x. So then we can just do this, and we're done, okay? So that's, um, that's how you would work through uh, exponential functions such as, um, such as this. So that would take you through 5a. Of course, you're just going to use the laws of exponents as usual. Review my video. It's going through these things, right? Like, I, I notice 5f, well, you're multiplying exponents. In uh, 5b, you're adding. In 5d, you're subtracting. There's, there's a lot going on there. And then what do you do with division? So let's go with, let's go with division. Let's, let's do number 6a. So number 6a, division, k to the power of three, oops, three quarters. And this is divided by k to the negative a quarter. Oops, k to the power of negative one fourth. And there we go. So what do we do there? Well, if you're dividing two numbers with the same base, then you're subtracting exponents. So you have to subtract. So this is equal to k to the power of, and I'll put this in brackets, 3 quarters, minus negative 1 quarter. Well, that looks awfully cumbersome, doesn't it? That's horrible. It's ugly. But when I'm subtracting a negative, I'm adding. Three quarters minus negative a quarter is really three quarters plus one quarter. So then we go equal sign k to the power of three quarters plus one fourth. That's really what we're talking about. Well, what is three quarters and a quarter? It's just one. Well, what's k to the one? It's just k. That's your answer. So then, okay. So now you know how to do division. So when you, you're dividing, you subtract the exponents. And there's a lot of that going on here. Now, some of it is hidden. Like in 
6b, you have to work with negative exponents again. So sometimes, you know, like maybe not so much 6b, but you know, there's, there's negative exponents in there. So sometimes you're going to be adding a negative or sometimes you're going to be multiplying by a negative by a negative and then you end up with a positive exponent. So you can see here that this is how we uh, go about doing uh, these sorts of um, these sorts of things. Once again, uh, I do have I do have uh, a description of this sort of stuff and more in the video that was posted last week, and it's on the timeline. Now let's go over. Uh, so th these are examples of working with rational exponents, and most of it, as you can see here, are just evaluating. Um, you know, you're you're evaluating numbers, numerical expressions. You're also no, you're also evaluating things like uh, you know, like numerical expressions like this one. And sometimes you're evaluating, you know, uh, expressions with variables in them, like that one there that I just highlight. Excuse me, that I just highlighted. So uh, you have a, a lot of different things going on here. So now, okay. A lot of good questions between numbers one and six. There's a lot of good questions there, uh, especially if you're rusty with this sort of stuff. Uh, if you have trouble, you know, practice is where it sticks here. And these sorts of things should stick up here, right? Um, that's what learning is. It's where you can actually go into the higher grade, you know, into grade 12, you already know this stuff. And now we, you're ready to learn the higher concepts, which is, you know, uh, it gets it, it gets uh, quite a bit higher when the higher grades you go. Okay. Um, a lot of these questions look like very practical problems, like uh, you know, uh, number eight, number eight on page one seventy six. Um, is about a square cube law, which is kind of weird. But uh, cube, well, you know, if you're if you're looking at an actual cube, in other words, a object where each edge, like a you know a, a six-sided object, three dimensions, which every edge is the same length, you know, that's a cube, right? Its volume will be the length cubed. And the surface area will be 6 multiplied by the side length squared. There is a, there is a, uh, a kind of a question whether is the ratio between the surface area and the volume, is that a constant or is that changing all the time? And I guess we could maybe demonstrate that. That's curious. Let's demonstrate whether, I mean, you could look up the square cube law on Google, but I'm not going to use Google. i got a spreadsheet. I can play with this. And you know what? Mathematics is all about playing with stuff. So let's take a look. Let's, here. So we have side length and um, side length, and we'll call that x. Okay, the side length of a cube. And we'll just, you know, do one, two, three. You know the drill, right? We'll just eh, do a bunch of numbers up to 10. Wait, we won't do very many. What about surface area? So surface area is really 6 multiplied by the square of the side length. So it's equal to 6 times this number squared. Well, 6 times 1 squared is 6 times 1. You're going to get 6. Volume is really just the side length cubed. So that's equal to 1 cubed. All right. So the volume is 1. The surface area is 6. Is it true that, you know, is the volume, is the surface area always a bigger number than the volume? 
it sounds counterintuitive. You would think the volume would be a bigger number because it's based on a cube. But it looks for now that the surface area is way ahead of the volume. What about if we just take this equation and go all the way down? Now, how did I get these numbers? Simple. The 6 times the square of whatever number happens to be under column A. So here this is 6 times 8 squared. This is 6 times 9 squared. That's the value under cell A10. This is 6 times 7 squared. You can see that, okay? This is 6 times 6 squared. You get it, right? Okay. What about volume? Well, let's see what happens here. This is going to be the side length cubed. Okay, 2 cubed is 8. Well, we're not out of the woods. 24 is still a bigger number than 8 so far. Well, now, 3. Side length of 3, we have 27. It turns out that's half of 54. It looks like the volume is catching up rather quickly. By the time we get to a side length of 4, well, there, the volume is getting there. It's here, the volume was one sixth of the surface area in terms of new, in terms of numbers. Here, you can no longer say that the volume is one sixth of the surface area when the side length is four. What about five? Hundred and twenty-five. Like I say, we're catching up. 6 cubed is 216. It turns out, oh, they're equal now. Okay, well that's a long way from where we started, isn't it? So let's keep going. Now it's 343. Now the volume is pulling ahead. And then the volume is 512. Now it's going way ahead. And now the volume is 729. Now let's go for a side length up to 10 just to conclude this. As a matter of fact, I think there's a, yeah, here, we'll just do it this way. And now we have a, a side length when we, when we say 100, 6 times 100 is 600, because that's 6 times 10 squared, but 10 cubed is 1,000. So now the volume is pulling way ahead. Um, it, would, it would be reasonable if we had the, the volume divided by the surface area it would, it would appear to me that the volume and the surface area are changing with respect to each other in terms of ratios. So um, maybe it, it would appear to me that volume divided by surface area, this number divided by this number, will not be a constant. So here we have 1 sixth or 0.167 repeating. And by the time we get to uh, a volume of 10, now the volume is bigger and so the ratio, the ratio of volume to surface area by the time we get to the end is much greater than one. And if we pull this further, if we go, if we go f up to 15, let's, let's see what happens if we go up to 15. Um, well, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, let go of the mouse the volume is two and a half times bigger than the surface area by the time we get to a side length of 15. So it doesn't look to me like we could say that there's a constant ratio. It looks like the ratio is changing. And not only that, the volume is increasing with respect to the surface area as in terms of numbers, okay? Um, so, Now, um, what could we say for part A and number 8? Now, we, we hadn't really done anything with number 8, but we actually played with this side length versus surface area thing in terms of what are the numbers doing, you know? Because sometimes when you're just playing with something, you sort, of, you sort of get a feel for what the numbers are doing. And I like to do that. I, that's how I sort of get the wheels turning in my, in my head. So for part A... Part A is asking, write a formula to express the area A of one face in terms of the side length L. Well, the area of one face is just L squared, isn't it? So the area of one face is just L squared. Uh, write a formula to express the side length L in terms of the area A. Oh, 
Ah, ooh, okay, I see where they're going. So then it's not the first question that is interesting, it's the second question that's interesting. So we have the area of one face equal to L squared, right? But what if you wanted L by itself on one side? What if you wanted L on one side by itself? Well, that means that over here, you'd have to take the square root of both sides, right? Well, the square root of L squared is L. That's okay. But with the square root of A, though, the square root of A is that. Um, hmm. I don't know why I don't have a... Um, Where's the vertical part of my square root? How about that? Oh yeah, it does it that way, doesn't it? Here. <laughs> okay, the Microsoft um, equation editor is kind of funny. It always has been kind of funny, but here you go. So that's part B. Okay, so all we're doing is we're doing a little bit of algebra. We're taking the square root of both sides and we're having a in terms of L, right? A as a function of L, right? And here's L as a function of A, right? L, the side length is a function of A, and here is the area of a face as the function of L. Kind of, kind of interesting, and it's, you know, um, kind of, um, it's sort of an interesting take on what we were doing in the last, uh, last unit when we were just looking at general functions. What is the side length of a cube? for which each square face is an area of 36. So now for part C, you're just plugging in numbers using one of these equations. Part D, modify your answers in part A and B to re relate the total surface area uh, to the side length L. So that you're basically multiplying your area of one face by six, and then use the results. So then you're plugging in on part E, it looks like. Okay. Um, and then for 9, you refer to question 8. Uh, and this is where you have the volume of a cube. So it's really this, a very similar sort of algebra. So, um, you know, it's just so, these are just good exercises for you guys to practice on and to develop your own understanding of, mm, excuse me, of the laws of exponents and how they are used in, in um, common problem-solving situations and in everyday situations. Um, really, I believe that's pretty much it for me. Uh, that's, uh, I think what I'll do is I will ask you to do the following exercises. So starting on page 175, this is section 3.3, page 175, numbers 1 through 6, as I told you, they're all good exercises. I didn't want to do a whole bunch of them. I, I'd love to do a whole bunch of them, but really you guys have to do the learning, so you guys do those exercises. Otherwise, I'm the only one doing the learning. The person doing the problem solving is the one doing the learning. I want you guys to do it, because that's how you learn. That's how you get good. Okay? That's how anyone gets good, by the way. Okay? So then, um, number eight. Finish number eight for me. Uh, number seven, ah, do seven as well. So seven, eight, nine. Really, so far, one through nine. And then, uh, let's see. Um, yeah, all these questions are connected. So we can go, really, I, I'm asking you to do numbers one through 11. All the, like the questions in section B up to number 11 are all connected. Um, and so that would be rather interesting. Um, number 15, I'll, I'll have you guys go into the extend part, number 15. This is where things get a little more interesting. And um, and number 16. So uh, for the surface area of a cylinder, I do not expect you that, by the way, number 15 is about the surface area and the volume of a cylinder. 
And to be honest with you, I'm not expecting you to memorize the, for, uh, the surface area and the volume of a cylinder. You can Google that. You can look it up. Just look it up and work with the question. So it's a very, very interesting problem. And I will keep it there. Anyone interested in doing gas laws, number 17 looks really strange. Uh, I'm not officially assigning that. But if you're doing uh, chemistry, especially... I believe grade 11 chemistry does um, uh, universal gas law, PV equals NRT. And um, in a, it says here in an expansion of a particular gas, the relation between the pressure in kilopascals and the volume in cubic meters is given by P squared V cubed equals 850. I don't know on what planet they're doing this. Uh, maybe, I don't know if that's worth doing, but, you know, uh, it's just that the P and the V caught my eye and something about gas uh, just caught my eye it could be an interesting problem i'm not sure though if it's a real world problem i'm, I'm not sure where p squared v cubed would be used um, but anyway um you don't have to do that problem so we're okay once again the exercises are um one through 11 15 and 16 okay all right good luck everyone